chapter 7. I did think we were going to finish the Sermon on the Mount this morning, but I can say with full confidence that we will not finish the Sermon on the Mount this morning. So, as I studied it, I thought, no, we had a, we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 23, and then next week we'll be looking at a building on the rock, such an important area of Scripture, so, so, so important to us. So, this morning, if you're taking note, verse 15 through 23, we'll look at in the text, and uh, the title to the message is, It's Time to Bear Fruit, or Time to Bear Fruit. And the main idea really is, listen, Jesus is teaching us how to be spiritual fruit bearers. You know, I don't want you to raise your hand, but truthfully, I'm going to ask you this question. How many of you guys have ever led someone to Jesus? Don't raise your hand. You know the ones who have are like, ha, 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 right here. Don't raise your hand. How many of you guys have ever genuinely been a part of discipling someone? You know, I'm talking about coming alongside of somebody. They fall in a pit. You're filled with the Spirit. You jump in the pit. You put them on your back. You get them out of the pit. You put them at the feet of Jesus. You wash them off. Then Christians start throwing stones at you because you did that. But then you keep going, right? How many of you have ever been a part of that? Don't raise your hand. You see, church, Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount, I believe his word to us this morning as a church it's, it's time to bear fruit, man. You know, one thing I did youth ministry for a long time, and one thing I would often hear from young people is they'll say, everything you're saying is absolutely true. But I'm young. I want to, like, kind of enjoy my life. Oh, yeah, it really looks like you're doing great, you know. Yes, as I'm talking to them through a glass, you know, and they're in jail. You know, I was like, wow, this is wonderful. You having fun in there? No, but when I get out, yeah, <laughs> I'll see you in 10 years. You know, but uh, I, I would hear this often. I really would. It would. They would say, when I get older, right, when I get older, I'll get serious with God. You know, it's funny, though. You know what I hear from the older folks? Next year... I'm going to get serious with God. And then the next year you go, you know what? The job's been busy. You know, the, my boys and the sports and the day. The next year, and before you know it, you know what's going to happen? We're going to be in the presence of God. And we're going to go, oh, man. <laughs> serious. It will happen. It's time to bear fruit, church. It's time. You know, the, the late uh, Dr. Walter Martin, they called him the Bible answer man. How many of you guys know about Walter Martin, right? Yes. If you don't know about Walter Martin, it's good. You read his stuff. Beginning, he says this, uh, beginning with the rock and roll era of the early 50s. By the way, we want to thank all of you for that. The youth of America have become increasingly disillusioned with their parents. Values and unwilling to submit to those values. Because of a newly dominant feeling that the self is the ultimate judge of what is right and wrong, young people have re-examined all the values passed down to them from the adult population. In their examination of these traditional values, the youth have lacked an objective ethical standard and have therefore found no reason to keep those values. He said, thus, many of our youth today are valueless. Truth and morality have become completely subjective. That's a fact. This is Walter Martin. He's, he's been with the Lord for, I think, a decade now. He said this you know, 25 years ago. That's only grown this, this time. I read a story uh, this past week about a detective at Macy's. The detective was a Christian, and after working at Macy's for over 26 years, he was, fined, he was fired for standing up to a man claiming to be transgender who was in the ladies' restroom. The reason why he responded, he said a female customer and her daughter had informed this detective uh, that they were afraid to use the restroom because a transgender man was in there. The detective asked the man to leave <laughs> so the mother and daughter could enter. The man refused. After a time, the man left the restroom holding the hand of his female companion, which doesn't make any sense, still claiming to be transgender. The man then filed a complaint with store management and the detective was promptly fired. Why am I telling you this? This is what is happening in the world around us, church. Calvary Chapel Grace Fellowship, this is what is happening in the world around us. This is the deal. It's happening. And I believe the text this morning, I believe Jesus would say to you and I, it's time to bear fruit. It's time for you and I to bear fruit, to grow, to stay the course, to do what God has told us to do. Now, listen, as I say that, does that mean, all right, next week you come in with military garb, 
You come to the pastor, I attention. No, that's not what it means. Listen. You know, uh, you know the, the body of Christ in the Christian life, it is a garden, not a factory. It's the reason why Jesus tells us to bear fruit. You know, if I, right now, we were to walk into a factory, there would be some elements that we would experience right away. Number one, it would be mechanical. Things are moving without any human, you know, need. Things are moving. There's conveyor belts. There's banging around. There's an attitude that's kind of like, we just got to get things done, right? It's a factory mentality, right? The smell in the air is that of just sweat, right? It's out of labor. People usually in a factory aren't like, wow, it's good to see you. What are they like? I didn't sleep last night, right? That's a factory. That's a factory. Now, if I say a garden, right? There's a whole other idea to a garden, isn't there? You think of a garden, you think of the wind blowing, right? You think of life. You think of fruit coming up. You think of time. It takes time, right? You think of rest. If you could go into a garden and be unrestful, you need to pray more. You know what I mean? You think of rest, of calmness. Listen, this morning, we're going to move here into Matthew 7. We're almost done with the Sermon on the Mount. But I believe it's time for us to bear fruit. And as we say that, it's going to be in the context of a garden, not a factory, right? I don't want you to leave this message this morning thinking, I have to work harder, try harder, be more. You know, if I don't sweat drops of blood like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm not a real Christian. No, that would be a mistake. But it is time to bear fruit, church. And Jesus is going to talk to us this morning on how to do just that. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to pick it up in verse 15. We just looked, chapter 7 was judge not, right? We talked about the beam in our eye, and that's a critical spirit. And then Jesus went into verse 7 through 12, talking to us about, well, how do you get that critical spirit out? You have to ask and seek and knock. Every one of us has that. But we have to seek the Lord and say, Lord, help me to be free of that critical spirit, right? That polluting influence. We got to ask the Lord for that. And then he talked to us just last week, verse 13 through 14, about how it's a narrow gate, Jesus told us. It's one way. We talked last week about how if Jesus would have made 10,000 ways, Satan would have just counterfeited with 100 million ways. So Jesus made it simple. There's one way, and it's through himself, and he died on the cross, and anyone can be saved. And now we move into verse 15. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets. Can you guys say beware? Beware. Beware. If I was an actor, I'd have a good voice, but I'm not. Beware of false prophets, Jesus said. He says, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Wow. Those are pretty harsh words from our king. Huh? Number one, if you're taking to to notes in terms of it's time to bear fruit, number one, is you need to find the real and stick with it. You need to find what's real and you got to stick with it. Stick with it. You got to find what's real and stick with it. That's what it takes. You know, uh, Jesus starts off here and he looks at his disciples. He's teaching this sermon on the side of the mount that's coming up from the Sea of Galilee. They're there, listen to him. He's been talking to them since chapter five. He gave them the Beatitudes and he's speaking to them about pretty much everything they need in life. But now he turns his attention, and he's not saying be judgmental. He's not saying be critical. He's saying what? Be aware. Be aware. Be aware of what? This word, be aware, if you're taking note, you could jot it down. It means constantly be on the watch. You have to constantly be on the watch. If you want to bear fruit, you have to constantly be on the watch. And Jesus is going to tell us why here. This word, beware, also means to turn the mind to. To turn the mind to, you have to, you have to be in control. We talked about this a few weeks ago when Jesus spoke about do not worry about your life. You have control over what you think about. You know, if the enemy, if you wake up tomorrow morning and the enemy dumps a, you know, a dumpster of bad thoughts on your mind and you just take them in, you're going to have a bad day, guys. That's what's going to happen. But the Bible tells us you have the 
ability, you have the mind of Christ, you can take those thoughts captive and say, these are not from Jesus. These thoughts are not from my Lord, right? Wearsby says you, can, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from making a nest in your hair, right? You can do that. Now Jesus says, beware. Look what you turn your mind to. You know, uh, recently my family, we were in a place that was very, very crowded, packed. And uh, it's kind of amazing because my kids, rightfully so, respectfully, they call their mother, they don't call her Rachel, they say mom, right? But we were in a place, not only was it packed, it was very loud. Not only was it packed, not only was it loud, but there was actually a lot of moms there. So you would consistently hear, mom, mom. Now there were times where I was with my kids, they would be shouting at the top of their lungs, mom, she didn't know. Now, between you and me, I think she might have, but she just wanted a little rest. No, 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 I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, mom, she's just, ah. So then I gave him a little, just like I signed the pass. You know what I mean? I wrote the pass, I signed it, I gave it to him just this once. You could call her Rachel. And when they called her by name, she heard because it was directed. You know, you can hear... You can hear the voice of God, right? I'm sure many of us, even this past week, there was something we were walking into or somebody was saying something to us and the Holy Spirit was going, saying your name. And you could hear it, but you had to make a choice. Am I going to respond to the Lord? You see, that's where Jesus starts off here. He says, beware. What are you supposed to be aware of? Jesus tells us. After telling them that they were that there was an, a narrow gate to get to heaven into the kingdom, then Jesus says, be aware of what? False prophets. You know, one thing a false prophet says, they say every road leads to God. Right? They say what Dr. Walter Martin was talking about. Truth is relative. What the Bible calls sin, eh, not so much sin to me. Well, it's not good. There'll be consequences. Jesus said, beware of false prophets. Prophets, beware, beware, beware of the one that says it's all a buffet that comes from the same restaurant. Beware. Um, a few years ago, I went to visit uh, uh, somebody's parent who was in the hospital. They have a religious background, very sharp, shrewd individual. And, you know, they come from a religious background, but they knew they believed many roads lead to heaven. So whenever I'm dealing with a sharp, shrewd individual, I try to be as sharp and shrewd as I can, which is pretty small. But we're beginning to talk, and she was telling me, all roads lead to heaven. Pastor, I know you believe that. But, and I, I said, oh, if you would for a minute, and I took out my, my cell phone, which uh, there it is, and I gave it to her, and I said, would you just for a second do me a favor? Just call your daughter for me. I just wanted you to ask her a question with me here. So she takes out the phone, and she was having trouble with the touch screen. And she takes it out, and she starts telling them, I says, no, no, no. Don't dial the 10 numbers that you reach her with. I said, just dial whatever 10 numbers you feel like. Whatever makes you happy, dial those 10 numbers. You'll get her, right? She literally knew what I was saying immediately. Some of you guys are going, what? I don't understand. I'm saying, <laughs> she's sharp. Immediately she knew. She goes, I know. She goes, so you don't have to ask her anything? I said, no. I said, that was for you. You know, that's a, fa a false prophet begins to tell people, all roads lead to heaven. It's not our message to change. It's Jesus's. You see, this false prophet for your note taker, the word false in the Greek is pseudo. And it's, it's your and my job to find the real, as I said earlier, and stick with it. It's your job. You know, I can't do that for you. I can't be in your conversations. I can't be in your ear as you're taking in Bible studies. You know, one of the benefits of this age is we could take in messages all week long. You can listen to messages online. One of the benefits of this age is that. One of the greatest negatives of this age is you could take in messages all week long. <laughs> it really is. Because, you know, when you're in kindergarten, remember they told you, you are what you eat. It's the same works in the spiritual. Same. Jesus said, be aware of false prophets. You see, Satan wouldn't have created pseudo-prophets if there wasn't something real. There's something real. You see, God wrote a book. It's for you and I to learn it and grow. A lot of the religions and the cults are intending, Satan's using them to intend to flood the markets and get people to hopefully try everything and leave hopeless, believing nothing is real. I mean, how many people have you met? 
This happens here at Calvary Chapel all the time. I'm done with religion. We had somebody recently, pastor, I love the church, but I don't like organized religion. You know, it's, it's so tempting sometimes. Like, just stand with me for a week and see how this thing works, man. This is, every day, it's like a roller coaster. I never, you know, I have a plan, and then every day, God goes, <laughs> boom, that's what happens in my life, right? And, but it's wonderful, you know, it's wonderful to see how God works. But it, it's amazing, you know, the religious phonies try to blur the lines. That's how it works. Jesus tells us this. But the Bible, church, listen, is filled with warnings against false prophets and teachers. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about it, so it's important that we understand this. If you're taking it, you can jot it down. You'll see these scriptures up on the, the screen. Deuteronomy 13. This is all the way in the Old Testament. This is before the children of Israel move into the promised land. Deuteronomy 13 says, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams... And he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, so it works, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. Moses says they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy, Moses, the children of Israel are going into the promised land. Moses says to them, guys, I don't care if a prophet comes or a dreamer of dreams comes and they do a miracle. If it draws you after a false god, you do not follow. God is knowable. He is definable. In the book of Acts in the New Testament, this is the first church, right? Jesus was the one who had the idea of the church. He was the one that started the church when the Holy Spirit came on the disciples at the day of Pentecost. Jesus was the one that looked at Peter after Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, right? And Jesus said, on this rock, I will build what? My church. The church was not started by man. The church was started by the God man, Jesus Christ. But in Acts chapter 20, this is the first church. Verse 29, this is Paul with the Ephesian elders because there still has to be order in the church, because our God is a God of order. He says to them, For I know this, Acts 20, verse 29, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things, look at this, to draw away the disciples after themselves. So this is how you always know a false prophet. You know a false prophet because they draw people after themselves. You know Solomon, though he made quite a few mistakes in his life, namely 999 or whatever, you know, 9,999. 9, Probably one of them was supposed to be his wife. The other 9,999 shouldn't have been. But there was still wisdom yet. And remember when the woman, the, the two women had the babies and the one rolled over and, and killed her in his sleep. But then she took the, the baby from the other woman. And then they went to Solomon, the king, and they said, well, who's, you know, the one, they're both claiming that the, the baby was their child. And you remember what Solomon said? He says, let's cut this baby in half. You take half, you take half, and then we go. Do you know what Solomon did? It's the same today. It's the same spirit. That's how you always know the true from the false. The true parent, the true parent will say, you just take the baby. The true parent will just, no, 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 I'm not going to slander. I'm not going to defend. I'm going to let it go. Why? Because they want to keep the baby intact. The false parent will say, let's do it. That sounds good. I'll take three fingers. You know, it's like, whoa, that's a ravenous wolf. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said, church. That's how it works. Second Peter chapter 2, Peter also warns us about these false prophets. It's important you catch this. You need this. Because if you don't understand the true from the false, you will not bear fruit. You won't. 2 Peter 2, verse 1, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly, secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, who bought them. <laughs> They'll say Jesus was just a man. He was a really good man, though. <laughs> Peter said no. And bringing on themselves swift destruction. Verse 2, And many will follow their destructive ways. Look at this. Because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Verse 3, By covetousness they will exploit you. My goodness, there's nothing new under the sun. With deceptive words, for a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. 
So you know a false prophet if they tell you to go after a false god. You know a false prophet if they say, come follow me. And you know a false prophet if they're trying to make merchandise of you. I'm shocked sometimes today how we're not able to discern this. You know, in the first church, you, the Word of God, the New Testament was being formed by the Holy Spirit, but they had a book. It was like a manual for the church. It was called the, the Didache. Didache. It was like a manual for churches. And in it, it was clear if a prophet comes to you and basically tells you like, give me your money, help me, do things for me. You know, I haven't been a senior pastor my whole life and I've been a part of many different churches. It's always bothered me when a pastor is saying me. It always bothers me. Because, because a pastor is a shepherd. <laughs> the Bible says a, pastor, a shepherd's to lay down his life for the flock. Right? Jesus, the great shepherd, he didn't say to his disciples, you wash my feet. What did Jesus do? He washed the feet. Right? The false makes merchandise of you. Rather than feeding you, they want to fleece you. Now it says that back to Matthew, it says they come to you in sheep's clothing. Now I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, what does that mean? Guys, it's, it's, it's what it means is what it says. It's that a false prophet, it's amazing that we think like this. A false prophet will never come to you with a Dracula Halloween costume on. Never. They're like, oh, oh, oh. It's never going to happen. It's not going to happen. The false prophet doesn't appear like that. The false prophet doesn't come with Frankenstein things come over here. Oh, I'm a false prophet. Come with me into the pit. That will never happen. It never will happen. <laughs> Jesus knew that. Sometimes we're like, yeah, but they didn't seem like they were a false prophet. Of, co of course they did it, right? Write this verse down, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Paul tells us that Satan himself appears as an angel of light. Sin and temptation is always attractive on the outside. Always. Sin and temptation is always attractive on the outside. The problem is when you crack the outer shell, what you find underneath, it's not attractive anymore. But in order to find what's underneath, you got to be aware. You got to be aware. You have to be aware. He says he comes to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolf. You know, how do you, seriously, how do you recognize a false prophet? How do you ra recognize a ravenous wolf? It's so simple, it's scary. I remember years ago in the church, we've had situations like this, and, you know, I'll speak to, uh, you know, I'll speak to, you know, my overseers, Calvary Chapel pastor who's been doing it for 40 years. I remember I spoke to one of the guys, and we are talking, he says, Bill, it's so simple, it's scary. <laughs> he says, listen, when you look out at a pasture of sheep, what are they doing? They're, they're all down eating grass. That's what they do. So look out. If all the sheep are eating grass and one of the sheep is literally eating one of the other sheep, it's not a sheep. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's profound. You know, <laughs> like go over, flip the thing up and you go, oh, that's a, that's a costume. You're not a sheep. Ah, right. There's an Aesop's fable about this. You know, the, the, the man goes out, he's really hungry, he wants, you know, lamb for dinner, and he goes to the biggest sheep in the, he's like, man, this sheep is so much bigger than all the other sheep. And he kills it, when he gets back, he discovers it wasn't a sheep, you know. The beautiful thing is the great shepherd always finds these things out. He always, always does. He always finds the, the ravenous wolves that really that aren't in it for Jesus. They're in it for themselves or their ideas. And the Lord will discover that and he'll deal with that by his spirit. And Jesus says here, if you want to bear fruit, the first thing you got to do, you got to find what's real and you got to stick with it. Let's move on. Verse 16, Jesus now goes on. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Verse 17, even so, look at this, every good tree bears good fruit. Is that complicated? Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Not possible. You might be here going, life is tough. I've literally seen believers that are struggling tremendously, tremendously, and still fruit is coming out of their lives. And what that tells me is, they're a good tree. Maybe make some bad decisions, but still a good tree. 
A good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree, guys, a bad tree bears bad, you know, uh, it doesn't. Nor can a bad tree uh, bear good fruit. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Now, maybe as we read that, you're starting to go, <laughs> am I a ravenous wolf? If you think you're a ravenous wolf, you know what that means? You're not a ravenous wolf. If you're a wolf here, you know. No, no, that's, you have to go to the bathroom. You can go, you know, <laughs> like, oh, I'm going to have to hold it all time. No, no, no. <laughs> I was waiting into this point in the message to say that. I, I, I thought, anyways, number two, if you're taking note, time to bear fruit. Number two, if you want to bear fruit, you need to realize you're flawed, but you're fruitful. A good tree is flawed, but fruitful. Remember at the beginning of the message, I said, I want you to picture, you know, a factory and then a garden. You know, there's a, uh, there's a beautiful place my family goes to pick apples and we'll get some vegetables. Beautiful place. I mean, it's got blueberries, raspberries, apples. You guys want to know where it is? I'm not going to tell you because, you know, I can't tell you. But it's beautiful. And uh, we go there. It's, it's an incredible place. But what's amazing is this. It's dirty. It's actually dirty. Like, I know this is crazy. Some of you guys are like, what do you mean? There's dirt on the ground. Literally. You gotta walk up. You pick the fruit. It's crazy. It's actually dirty. The fruit, it's dirty fruit. How's that possible? Because it's real fruit. That's how real fruit. If you get a piece of fruit that's just so perfect, you've never seen it, probably don't want to eat it. You know, it's like they dipped it in bleach 20 times. And it's like, shit. you ever go to the store, you get an apple and it blinds your eyes? I don't usually buy those apples. You know, I'm like, I don't think God made apples to blind people. You know, guys, real Christians are flawed but they're fruitful. What's happened in the body of Christ today is we've taught people, if you're really a Christian, you're perfect. Uh, that's impossible. <laughs> that is not real. And the Bible contradicts that. John the Apostle says, if anyone says they are without sin, they are what? A liar. And the truth isn't in them. But if you confess your sins, God's faithful and just. You see, if you're a, real, if you're a good tree, you will bear good fruit. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits. You will know a false prophet by what they are converting men and women to. That's what you'll know. A false prophet is known by what are you converting men to? Are you converting someone to your way of thinking? Right? Are you converting someone to, you know, being healthy, wealthy, and wise? That's what Christianity is all about. You see, a false prophet doesn't preach himself or herself or their idea or their denominational view even. No offense to denominations, but I'm, I'm just saying that's not what we preach. What we preach is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We preach the same message today that Paul preached and Peter preached and Luke preached. One of my favorite things to do here is when somebody comes from more religious background, they go, wow, this is like a new thing, huh? I go, really, it's not. This is older than religion. We're, we're trying to do it like the book of Acts, actually. We gather, we worship, we pray. It's real people. We open the Bibles. We open the Bible. We learn it. We fellowship. And then guess what we do the next time? The exact same thing <laughs> again. That's what they did. We're, we're flawed, but we're fruitful. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4, you could jot that down. It's there. Paul defines what the gospel is. Paul tells us the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to win somebody to Jesus, you got to tell them the gospel. You'll be shocked. You'll explain science and all these things to them, and they'll, their thinking may change. But what we see here all the time, all the time, even at, we shared the story original, at the beginning of the message about the transgender bathrooms. All the time, I have never talk with somebody here about we don't talk about politics i'm not trying to change your thinking but you know what's amazing when the gospel is preached and somebody's life is changed and they begin to read the bible they change because jesus changes us you know these other arguments are lesser arguments church be careful that is not your message your message is jesus it's jesus that's what this world needs, desperately, desperately needs Jesus. The good news is, is this. Now, maybe you're saying, 
you know, practically, you're saying, Pastor, but didn't we just learn that we're not to have a critical spirit? Yes, but guys, listen, we are to look for fruit. Now, it's important you understand fruit does not equal flawlessness. That's not true. That's a bad understanding. Often in Christian circles today, we are teaching people how to look Christian. That is a mistake. It's a mistake. The disciples, literally, the disciples, they would go out, do ministry. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees would look at them and go, these people are obviously untrained and uneducated, right? Like, obviously. But they couldn't get away around the fact, they said, but they have obviously also been with Jesus. Oh, that that would be said of us, right? That's my favorite. Somebody says, man, you're kind of a little rough around the edges, but it's obviously you know the Lord. That's when I go, triple cherry, man. Yes, I'm not a gambler, but I'm just saying, you know. We're flawed, but we're fruitful. You see, the issue is not flawlessness, but fruitfulness. Now, maybe you're here and you go, Pastor, I know I'm a Christian, but I, I can honestly say there's not much fruit that comes from my life. I have never led somebody to Christ. I feel like there's not much fruit that comes from me. What's the problem? Listen, if you're taking no jot it down, you'll see these scriptures on the screen. As a believer, the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you, but now God's given us tools, and he talks to us about this in his word. The first scripture is Titus, the book of Titus. Paul is speaking to one of his protégés in the face. Titus 3, verse 14. Paul says to Titus, and let our people also learn, look at this church, to maintain good works. Maintain, that word maintain in the Greek is proistemi. It means to set or place before or to set over, to protect or guard. It means to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Can I tell you this? If you do not prioritize good works, you know what will happen? You guys ready? You won't do them. You won't do them. <sighs> if you are going to be a fruitful farmer, you have to be consistent. If you get all, oh, I, I want to have the greatest farm in the whole county. And you go out there and you plow the land. And you till the soil. And you plant the seed. And you put the water on. And you do all this work. And then six months later, you come back. You're going to, it's not going to work, guys. It's not how farming works. Christianity doesn't work like that here. If you want to bear fruit, you have to be diligent to maintain good works. You have to meet urgent needs that you will not be unfruitful. I'm thinking about if I should say this or not. Um, you know, in our life, we do other things, you know. Like, I'm a pastor of a church, and I'm here all the time. We have prayer on Tuesday night, I'm here. Wednesday night, I'm, he I'm here. Sunday I'm only here. I'm a hologram right now. I'm actually at home speaking to you from the video camera. No, I'm here, right? Because that's how ministry works. It works with real people talking and touching each other. But I want you to understand, in order to be here, I had to say no to things. Do you understand? Like yesterday, there was a men's conference. In order to be there, I had to say no to things. That's how it works. You know, my son, they just won the championship, the town of tuxedos, the static. Lukey pitched all the meaningful games. I mean, how many times can I tell you this, right? As many times as I can. I think 16 strikeouts in the last game. Anyways, so they decided, hey, we're going to have a baseball tournament. And Lukey's our pitcher. Oh, really? Great idea. When is that going to be? Well, it's going to be Saturday, August, whatever yesterday was, 3rd. And Sunday, August 4th, 9 and 11. I said, man, that's wonderful. You guys do great. I said, my son will be with me at the men's conference. You know where my son was? He was at the men's conference with me. His Bible was open. He was there. You know why? Because I don't care what these people think. I mean, I love them very much. I care what Jesus thinks. And I know what it takes, guys. If my son and my daughter are going to follow Jesus, they're going to have to learn to put Jesus in a place, like Paul says, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to set or place before, to set over, to protect or guard. If you don't say, this is what I do, this is why I do it, and you know what? If you guys got a better way, you show me, but so far, I'm not seeing it. What I'm seeing is suicide rates skyrocketing. I'm seeing kids who are depressed on medication, doing drugs. I'm seeing pain, brokenness. So me and my family, like Joshua, we say, 
we're going to serve the Lord. And we'll see what happens after. We'll see how it works out. If, if when Luke is 30, he's going to be like, if you let me go to that baseball tournament, that's not going to happen, you know. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. I'm going to tell you. My kid, I wake, he get up, he's, out of the, he's on the porch reading his Bible. He does the Bible reading plan. <laughs> 11 years old. Now listen, I just lost so much rewards in heaven. So now I need your prayers. And the reason why I say this to you, and I cringe to say this, because I hate to come across like, good job, Bill, right? Because <laughs> it's not what it is. It's the grace of God. But if you want to maintain good works, if you want to be fruitful, right? If you're with the best farmer in the land who has the most fruitful crop, and it's one o'clock in the morning, he's not going to be there. You know why? Because he has to be up in the morning to tend his crop. That's what it takes, church. Like, that's what it takes. It's time to bear fruit. And we got to kind of catch these things. It's really not that complicated. It's really, you know the best part? When you stand up for Jesus in a cultural setting, the people will be mad at you at first, and then they will thank you later. They will thank you later. They will. Because, because they'll see the blessing of, your, of the fruit that comes from your life because you maintain good works. You are immovable. See, most of the people's lives around us are so chaotic, they don't even know whether they're coming or going. As believers in Jesus, we have the North Star. We have Jesus. We're never lost. Even when we're lost, we're not lost. Amen? We're never lost because we have the North Star. These guys are following the little dipper and this thing. Oh, my goodness. It's three years and that was an airplane. Oh, geez. You know, they're following the next wind of doctrine. We have the North Star. We're still preaching the same gospel. That's what it takes to bear good fruit. Jesus tells them here, watch out for those false prophets, man. Verse 21, if you thought that was hard, just wait. These are some, and I try to bring about by the Spirit the same tone that Jesus brought about in his messages, just so you know. And as Jesus is coming to the close of the Sermon on the Mount, this is what it sounds like, and you don't believe me, look at this. Verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, look at this, in your name, it says. Have we not cast out demons in your name, right? And done many wonders in your name. Number three, if you're taking note in terms of time to bear fruit, number three is you need to live with Jesus as Lord. You see, there's a difference between saying Jesus and Lord, is saying Lord and doing Jesus as Lord, like living it. Like saying every morning, Lord, this is your life. You bought me. Peter said it. He says, they deny the Lord who bought them. He purchased us, guys, with his own blood. Jesus is the one that made you and I as valuable as we are today. You know, something is, is only as valuable as some, in terms of as the cost, the price that somebody is willing to pay for it. And God says about you and I, I was willing to give my only son to die for you. You know what that means? We're valuable. If the world says we're not, don't worry about it. The Lord says you are. You're valuable. But Jesus here says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, this is a tough one. <laughs> you know, Jesus, I believe, is saying here, these wolves and these false trees, they'll come around and talk about Jesus and they'll say, we prophesied. We did this. We preached messages. We cast out demons. This is tough. This is a tough area of scripture to properly exegete, to properly bring out and share with you. They'll say, we did miracles. And you know what kind of struck me as I studied this? In your name. Jesus says it three times. Now listen, I'm not here to offend you if you're the prayer person that prays something and then says, in the name of Jesus. Like, I'm not here to offend you. But I am here to say, look at this. You know, it's not wrong to do that. But it doesn't matter how loud you shout in the name of Jesus if you're not right with Jesus. It doesn't matter. If you're living in sin and you're doing all these private things and your heart is bitter and you're just slandering everybody, but in the name of that, Jesus is going, who's that? 
You know, what are you talking about? He's not okay. Not okay with him. Is it, if that's your natural, now listen, if you're just, if that's not how you'd pray, but there's like this person, you like, like how they pray, so you pray like that, don't pray like that. If that's how you pray, then pray like that. Praise the Lord. But if by doing that doesn't mean anything if it's not real to you. It's a tough very scripture, huh? Yeah. Just imagine being there with Jesus saying this. This is nothing. You know, they say here, Jesus says here, we prophesied. He says they cast out demons. They did miracles. And it's kind of a tough one to understand this. How could these wolves, these false teachers, these counterfeit trees do these things? I have three things as I studied that I came up with. Number one, they're lying. They're lying. They actually never did these things. They just thought about them. And they've told stories about it. You know, I've met many people that are the greatest evangelists I've ever met. And then I say, is there anybody ever led to Jesus? No. Well, it's like saying, I'm an apple tree. Where's the apples? Well, no apples, but I'm really a good apple tree. Well, it doesn't work like that, right? One is that these things never happened. They were lying. Man, this is, this is a tough teaching because I have a, you know, it, you ever wonder, when I was first saved, you know, I used to have a, a weight set in the living room and I would watch television. When I got born again, then I started watching Christian television. I'm a brand new Christian. I don't know an epistle from an apostle, right? I'm just getting started. I'm halfway through Matthew. I'm watching, I mean, I'm watching the channel, the big channel, you know, it's what and I'm just going for, I'm like, wow, you know, it's, it's, it really is beneficial for working out because it's so exciting. You know, like, wow, yes, yes, yes. But as I begin to watch, one day something hit me because obviously every, mo the majority of those fellows are basically saying like, if you send me your money, you're going to get rich. And one day I was working out and it came to me. I says, no, wait a second. If this is true, why don't they send me their money and they'll get even richer, right? You're going, pastor, don't touch it. I did already, so it's too late, you know. You want to know who they are? You have to come up later, I'll tell you. No, no, not in front of everybody. You know, guys, it's not, that's not the gospel. Jesus says, you want to bear fruit? You have to be aware. You have to, you have to eat the right food. Or you could go out and get on the most intense training exercise program ever in history. If after it, you eat a diet of McDonald's, Burger King, and Dairy Queen... It's not going to be okay for you. It's just not. You are what you eat. And Jesus is saying that here. The second possibility of these false prophets is possibly they did these works actually by the power of the devil. The Bible tells us this. There's two areas of scripture. Acts chapter 8, verse 9 and on. This was Simon the sorcerer. He came on the scene. The Bible says he was doing these miracles, but it was by not by the Holy Spirit. It was by another power. What's amazing is he hears Philip, he hears the message of Philip, he repents and asks Jesus into his life. Then Peter and John come, the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, and Simon the Sorcerer says, I want that power. He takes out his checkbook to buy the blessing of God. We are doing the same thing today, it's unbelievable. To buy the blessing of God, Peter, you know, whenever somebody's been shown much grace, that usually means they're harder on other people. That's usually how Christianity works, right? Not how it's supposed to, but how it usually works. And what Peter does is he, he calls Simon out. And he says the, false, the falseness of his gospel is coming from, read the area yourself, he says it's a bitterness in your heart. I believe that is a key to becoming a false prophet. Most people I've met that all of a sudden you're like, what? You know, they come to you in sheep's clothing and then afterwards you, you go, where did all those bite marks come from? You know, it's because there was a bitterness in their heart that they didn't resolve. Seriously, be honest. By a show of hands, how many of you through the course of your life have been hurt deeply? Be honest. The people who aren't raising their hand are lying right now because they're probably the hurt by more than everybody. That's the truth of life. The truth of life is it's not you that has to make a choice about becoming bitter. It's, it's us. It's all of us. And when you allow that bitterness to get in or you allow the slander and the gossip and all the false things to get in, what happens is it, it's Satan going after your heart. 
forgot. He's trying to distract you from this one reality that you are a sinner dead in your transgressions and sins and Jesus Christ saved you. If you and I just take a breath and we acknowledge that, that should carry us for the rest of our lives. It should carry us. But this bitterness gets in there and Peter calls out the bitterness in Simon the sorcerer. And I believe it was because Peter loved Simon and he knew how detrimental this could be. But it could be by false power. Exodus 7, verse 8 through 12, we won't read it, but it's there. Moses comes in, God gave him this sign. He throws down his staff, right? It was a sign before Pharaoh. Throws down his staff, it becomes a snake. The Bible tells us that Pharaoh's sorcerers and magicians also threw down their rods and they all became snakes. The implication, there was like 40 of these guys. If you read the text though, you know what's amazing? A little side note. Moses' one snake swallowed all of them. All these guys were walking around with a limp. They didn't have their, their cane no more. You know what I mean? Swallowed them all. One snake. That's the gospel. So though there may be thousands of false prophets, the one message of Jesus, you know what it does? It swallows it all up. Spurgeon used to say, they'd come in, people would say bad things about Spurgeon, the church, and they'd say, you gotta, you gotta defend yourself. And Spurgeon would say, how do you defend a lion? You just let it out of his cage, man. You just let it loose. All you gotta do is spread the gospel and it deals with things. The power of the Holy Spirit. So that's the second possibility here. But the third one is, the Lord could have simply been using them in spite of themselves. And I know for some of us that's hard to understand but it's maybe because you don't yet understand the grace of God. The grace of God is so powerful. You and I can still be used of God even when we are being an enemy. Even when we're not loving our brother or sister in Christ. God is so gracious. The cross is so powerful. God could have been still using them for His glory in spite of them, not because of them. And it's powerful. And this is the last verse, verse 23. We're almost done here. And Jesus said, And then I will declare to them, if this doesn't send chills up your spine, you're just not paying attention. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Whew. Whew. Guys, it's time to bear fruit. We've looked at, you need to, number one, find the real and stick with it. Number two, we're flawed, but we're fruitful. Number three, you need to live with Jesus as Lord. And number four, Listen, this is so important. You need to acknowledge that God knows you. You need to acknowledge that God knows you. I've heard this, this area of scripture taught so many times, I believe erroneously. The Bible here does not say, Jesus doesn't say, and then I will declare to them, you never knew me. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's not what the Bible says, is it? Is that what it says? It says here, God says, I never knew you. Now listen. Does God know you? I think we would all say, obviously, yes, of course he does. But have you realized, have you come to the place yet in your life that you have realized, your eyes have been opened to this reality, you guys ready for this? That God doesn't know you. God knows the real you. You're going, what do you mean, pastor? I am the real me. You're a liar. You're lying. You are. You're going, yeah, that's my, my wife. That's who you're talking to. My husband. No, it's all of us. Why did Jesus say this? Why did Jesus say, listen, the false prophets, they never came to realize, I know you. You see, all the false prophets do the same thing, the false teachers. They all posture themselves. They all play a game that we used to play when we were little. It's called, you ready? pretend. They pretend that they don't sin. That's called playing pretend. You see, Jesus' problem with these folks here wasn't that they didn't know him. It's never been about that, guys. Christianity, salvation, going to heaven isn't about you and I keeping up with, you know, the Olympic, you know, Usain Bolt is sprinting and Jesus is like, oh, you haven't trained enough and you can't keep up with me, you don't go to heaven, you're never going to catch the same bolt. The guy could run backwards and he'd be, he'd pass it and you'd be like, <gasps> <gasps> he'd be like, we didn't start yet. What's he doing? You know, it, it doesn't work like that. The problem isn't you knowing God. The problem is you and I realizing God 
knows the real us. Salvation happens, listen, you guys ready? This is what biblical conversion looks like. The best I can do for you is you and I realizing God knows the real us and then the love of God coming and going like this. That's called being born again. God knows the real me and oh my gosh. Most people that were born again were born again with tears running down their face saying, how could this be true? Because you realize God knows the real me and yet the love of God, he loves the real me. Oh, it's crazy. I've been saved for 20 years. I still can't figure it out. I go, are you sure? Yes, okay. See, the problem isn't you and I don't work hard enough. We don't do enough ministry. Jesus says, you're going to come to me in that day and say, didn't I prophesy? I did miracles? I cast out demons in your name? But Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. You never came to the point where you realized, I know you. I've known you the whole time. I know this stuff about you that nobody else knows. And guess what? I'm still here. That's, that's biblical Christianity, guys. You want to reach this, this country with, the, gospel, with the, the love of Jesus? You want to see people saved? That's what it looks like. That's called the gospel. But in order to be a part of that, listen, like any real garden, there's dirt involved, man. We've got to wake up to that, church. It's not about being flawless. It's about being fruitful. Like if you're here today and you, you could say honestly, I love Jesus. I love him. It's because he loved you first. It's because he came and he met the real you and you were scared to even reveal it to him, but you confessed your sin, you confessed your need for him. And he said, I've dealt with it, son. Sweetie, I've done it. It's finished. Come here. I love you. And you're going, you love me? Yes. You love me? Yes. You love me? Yes. Man, you get in that family, you sit on the, you sit and you go, I never want to leave here again. It's, it's Jesus, guys. It's what he has for us. You know, I'll close with a story. My little girl, Selah, three years old, she's getting it, you know? Like she's new to the world. She's three years in, but she's new, you know? She's new to this whole thing. And recently she had this great revelation. Great, big, big revelation. She looked at her sister and she said, Bethany, she said, you're my sister. Bethany was like, yeah. She goes, you're, you're my sister. Yes. Bethany, you're my sister. Yes. But then she started connecting the dots. She went over to Luke. She said, Luke, you're, you're my brother. Yeah. You're my brother. Oh, you're my brother. It was so funny. I'm watching. It's like the Lord was just like speaking to me. Then she walked over to me and she goes, you're my father. It was crazy. You know, that, that's what we have to realize, guys. This area, what Jesus is saying here, I don't believe it is Jesus screaming and yelling at his people. I believe it's him saying, you need to realize I know you. And I love you. And I've died for you. And you're my son. And I need you to mature to the point where you realize, I'm your father. But you also need to look at your brothers and sisters and go, whether I like it or not sometimes. Whether you got dirt all over your face and you're laying in a gutter. You, you, you're my sister. You're my brother. Church, it's time to bear fruit. Jesus wants us to bear fruit. We could look at the shooting in, in Texas. Is it 42 shot? And then Ohio. I've brought out the USA Today article of the, the world looking on and seeing the suicide rate amongst 13 to 18 year olds up 58%. We can look at all this and we could scream and yell and march and 
chant and do all this stuff. I'm telling you right now, that is not the answer. <laughs> it's, it's the body. It's you and me, man. It's God's people. It's what they said in the book of Acts. They looked at the fishermen, Simon the Zealot, right? Who used to like try to lead, read, lead a rebellion against Rome. They looked at Thomas who was still like, I know Jesus died and rose and I stuck my finger in his hand. I'm still not sure. Thomases. It's the Mary Magdalene's who are adulterers, right? It's the Mary, the mother of Jesus's who are broken hearted. It's those that truly are uneducated, untrained men and women. But it's evident. It's real. They've been with Jesus. That's what it's all about, church. It's just truly realizing, Lord, you know me just as I am. You see me just as I am. You love me. And Lord, I just want to be more with you each and every day. That's it. It's the beginning and the end. It's the whole thing. If you want to bear fruit, that's it, guys. Amen?